So our first speaker is um, Rob Miller, the director of the Whittle Lab, and Rob is going to talk about the Aviation Impact Accelerator, an academic industry collaboration to accelerate aviation to climate neutrality. Okay, Rob, so you're on mute at the moment. Sorry, I, I said, can everybody see my slides? I'll reshare them. Okay, can you see my slides? Looks That's great. Brilliant. Okay, so for about the last uh, year and a half, um, quite a large group of um, academics and industry have been working on what we call the Aviation Impact Accelerator. And its aim is to explore ways to reduce the true climate impact of aviation. It's based really on the underlying principles that David Mackay used in his energy modeling. It's evidence-based, it's whole systems, and it's interactive. And the simulator, we're, we're very close to a first prototype, which we should be demonstrating soon. And you can see the front screen of the prototype here, which we showed a sneak preview at at COP. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a journey through the model, but before I do so, let me tell you a little bit about the model. So this model uh, goes from resource in, so you see four circles here. The resource in is the electricity, that's used, the land use, the water use, all the way through the fuel production. So we have hundreds of different fuel production routes with each of the components uh, uh, analyzed in terms of their technology readiness levels, their cost for scaling them, through the distribution of the fuel to the journey, to the passenger journey, which takes you all the way through the airport, through the flight, through the network modeling, up to the climate impact, such as contrails uh, in the air. So this is not a well-to-wake analysis that you'd usually have in aviation. It's the resource to climate analysis. It does, does the full route. Now, um, a, a model of this type is only as good as the data in. And the difficulty with flight is that um, it's a, a very technically constrained problem. The sum of a load of technologies do not make a play. So you really need expert advice from deep within the aerospace community. So together with the World Economic Forum, we have developed a set of questionnaires which have gone out over 80 of them around the world to a range of different companies, of different sizes, and what they do is they allow us to collect data from the deep te technical experts in those companies. And they give the values for particular technologies now, what they think they will be in 2035, and what they think they'll be in 2050. Uh, and not only values, they give the uncertainty they think at that date, and they give their confidence in answering the question. So it allows us to do quite a careful uncertainty analysis and propagate it through the model so that we can tell when we give an answer, not just one answer, but, but, but what the upper and lower limits are on those answers. Um, you also need to have access to deep technical expertise in a range of subjects. And as you see from the academic partners there, we have everything. Um, we have departments from across the university um, in, in business, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, Chemical Engineering, Transport Modeling from UCL. Um, in terms of the modeling capability, we've had a lot of help from companies such as MathWorks that help us on developing the model and making it user friendly. And the, the project really was inspired by the Prince of Wales Sustainable Markets Initiative and his, his call to take on the larger problem. Um, industrial advisors, these aren't people we meet once every three to six months. These are companies that have given us sort of complete open access to their deep technologists. So, for instance, over the summer, we were working with a team at Boeing to make sure our aircraft design models were realistic, and we've done similar with other companies. 
So before I started, before I get into actual uh, a, a model output, I thought I'd show you the breadth and depth of the model. So what I've done here is we've produced um, the greenhouse gas climate emissions of aviation um, for on the ground is on the left and in flight is on the right. And you can see that on the ground, we've got everything from the aircraft manufacturer to the fuel production, to hydrogen leakage. And in flight, you've not only got the CO2 effects of greenhouse gases, but you've got things like water vapor or NOx. Along the top line, you've got an example case for fossil uh, jet fuel. And you'll see there's a darker and a lighter circle. And the darker circle is the minimum and the lighter circles the maximum. So you can track the uncertainty through the model and on the right is, is, is the summation. As you're down the page, you'll see this is biofuels, heifer is the next one, then um, li power to liquid. So this is using electrolysis to make hydrogen, combine it with CO2 from the air, direct air capture and make an electro fuel that's put into a plane through to aircraft that run on blue hydrogen combustion, green hydrogen combustion, hydrogen fuel cells to battery electric. And you can, you can see if we look down the right hand side that at best all of them are a lot better than where we currently are, but you can see the uncertainty is, is quite high. And we've colored them green if they're better than the top line, the, 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 the current case, and red if they're worse. Now that's the greenhouse gas effects. But if I add into that the contrail effects or the climate forcing effects of uh, contrails, you'll see a, a much larger uncertainty coming into the problem. And you'll see the total climate forcing if we take into consideration contrails, and you'll see the incredibly high levels of uncertainty of the different solutions with great opportunity, but also great uncertainty at the moment. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of the model. So I'd like, like to talk about, I'd like to take you on a sort of trip through the model. And I thought we would do uh, Washington to COP, which is the, the, the one I demonstrated uh, um, in, in, at, the, at COP. Now, this, this the, the, the simulator looks very like Google Flights or Kayak.com. You choose where you're flying from, where you're flying to. The difference is you choose the year you want to fly and you choose your choice. Do I want climate impact? Do I want lowest greenhouse gases? Do I want lowest cost or some combination? And you'll see my flight here at the bottom. Now, as well as the standard settings, I can just press uh, model and that will give me the, the best for that route. Or I can go into the subsetting and I can change things. And in the subsettings, I can do a number of things. I can change the type of aircraft I want and the technology on those aircraft. I can change where my electricity source comes from. I can change my fuel type, what combination I'd like to consider in the optimization. I can consider where I get my biomass from or whether I make it from waste or vegetable oil. I can consider the number of airports around the world that I'd like to consider an optimization over. So, for instance, you might decide to um, uh, look at optimizing a flight which currently today would be one stop. But if you optimized it for lowest climate impact might in the future turn out to be say battery electric for the first stage, followed by a hydrogen, followed by a SAFS aircraft. It will do that optimization. Okay, back to the model. Um, so I'm gonna press solve on this and I've run through as an example, a team's run through a number of different solutions and we're gonna compare them for this route. Obviously, because this is over water, we, we can only go direct. And these are the four solutions which at the bottom of the screen you can see here that we've considered. Um, the baseline is what a kerosene aircraft would do in 2035, and that includes all the technology improvements. And then above it, we have three aircraft. Model one is a power to liquid. So that's 
the um, using electro electrolysis um, to produce hydrogen using renewable electricity. You pull carbon out of the atmosphere and you put them together with the Fischer-Tropsch process to make a fuel that switches into the aircraft. Model two is a completely new aircraft. So this is um, a hydrogen, liquid hydrogen aircraft. And this is running on green hydrogen. And model three is a, um, a blue hydrogen solution for the same aircraft. Now, the reason I've chosen those is because in 2035, um, Airbus says they'll have the zero E concept up and working, which is a hydrogen aircraft on the market. So in 2035, this is when you see hydrogen aircraft coming in. It's also about the time when people are starting to consider power to liquid fuels with direct air capture coming in. So, so that's an interesting question. And it's the point at which they think blue hydrogen will have scaled up and green hydrogen will start ramping up. So these three models give you a, a good sort of comparison of what could happen. You'll see the two outputs, climate impact and resource. The climate impact, you can see there's a big reduction as we move to green hydrogen and power to liquid. I'll look at those uh, in a minute. Um, but there's still a large uncertainty due to the contract. If we look at the resource, you can see the energy usage, the electricity usage for both the power to liquid and the green hydrogen solution are quite large. The electricity use for the power to liquid direct air capture is about a quarter higher than the green hydrogen. But to give you an idea of the scale of that energy use, if you wanted to convert all of the world's air fuel today to power to liquid, it would require an increase in world electricity of about 40%. Okay, and I want to jump in to those top two models because we can do that. And I've got model one and model two on the screen. Model one at the top is the power to liquid, the electrofuel, and the model at the bottom is the green hydrogen, liquid hydrogen. And I've now added on, you'll see above and below the purple and yellow bars, we have these dashed bars. And these dashed bars are the uncertainty, the minimum and the maximum that has been computed through the model. And so you see, if you compare, um, sorry, these two solutions, you can see the massive uncertainty between these two. And I think this is one of the key takeaways from this um, talk is that it's really important that there's so many uncertainties in the different routes at the moment that there's no clear winner, winner, but it's critical that we understand these uncertainties and we're going to make the right choices moving forward. Okay, I'm gonna end with just one sort of deep dive into one particular question in the model. And I think it's a particularly interesting one. And the, you're at 2035 and you've got blue hydrogen um, at airports and green hydrogen starts to ramp up. So I've plotted here, so I've, from the model I've extracted the data and I can do now a bit, a bit more detailed analysis. And the y-axis is the climate impact in grams of carbon per passenger kilometer. And we stack them up. So the green you can see is what's in the fuel production the ship, the, the transport of the fuel, and then the purple is split into two, the CO2 effects and the non-CO2 contrail effects. And the, over, the uncertainty bars, we can now split down. So you can see the uncertainty, and you can see that the uncertainty in the contrails effect is incredibly large. But the thing I want to show you here is comparing the CO2 effects in flight of using kerosene with the greenhouse gas effects in production for blue hydrogen. And you'll notice these two are quite similar in size and the uncertainties are quite large. And what the, the reason for this is because when you produce blue hydrogen, you're not extracting all the CO2. So some CO2 is going out in the production process and also methane is going out. And if you average that over a hundred years, you'll see the effects are quite similar. And this is showing in the model 
but, but really moving from kerosene in 2035 to blue hydrogen is not a good step and we should be accelerating green hydrogen uptake. Okay, so that gives you a brief um, a picture of the model. We should be uh, demonstrating the very first version of the, of the model um, um, relatively soon. And what it seems to show is while there's no clear, clear winner between the different paths yet, there's immense opportunity. There's specific technologies within these different routes can unlock change quite, quite rapidly if you understand the whole system's picture. And we believe the key to unlocking change is engagement of the wider community in an interactive evidence-based whole system understanding of the sector and we believe by putting out this sort of David Mackay style model, which can be accessed over the web, it will really engage both the public and policymakers in addressing the real challenges. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Rob. That was a very positive talk. I like, <laughs> I like that. I'm going to, well, there's quite a lot of questions in the chat, but I'm going to hold off um, uh, answer, um, asking those questions for you for a few more minutes until after the next talk by George Hawkswell and Rob and George will both answer questions together after George has given his talk. So um, next speaker is George Hawkswell, student at the Whittle Lab working with Rob Miller and um, George is going to talk about using distributed propulsion to make future electric aircraft more efficient. So George, if you'd like to share your slides. Sure. Okay, can, uh, can we see them? Yep. Great, okay. Thanks for the introduction, Lata. Uh, and uh, it's great to be talking here today. So we'll be talking about something called distributed propulsion and how that might allow electric aircraft to be viable in the, in the future. So we've already heard from Rob about uh, different types of aircraft uh, fuels and the, uh, the ranges that are possible with them. And for electric aircraft, the range is limited to about 600 miles at the moment. And the reason for that is that uh, batteries uh, don't store as much energy per kilo of weight. And so if I take a kerosene-based aircraft and just replace all of the kerosene batteries, I'll find that I can't fly very far because I haven't got enough energy. So to try and combat this, we need to look for other advantages of electric power systems. Uh, to try and increase the range. And one of the main ones is actually the flexibility of electric motors. Now, if I take uh, 20 or 30 electric motors, uh, I find that for the same amount of power as maybe one or two larger electric motors, they actually have very similar efficiencies. And this means that we can split up our propulsion into many smaller uh, bits and position it pretty much anywhere around the aircraft we like. So in uh, this image I've shown on the uh, screen, We've got eight uh, leading edge propellers uh, spread across the wing, uh, and we're going to, and hopefully that distributed uh, propulsion system is going to enable the aircraft to be more efficient. So let me talk about that in a bit more detail. So the problem we're trying to solve in my PhD is how you size uh, wings to make them as efficient as possible. How currently, as an aircraft comes into land, uh, it needs to meet a certain landing speed, and typically a designer will have to increase the size of the wing in order to be able to land uh, at that speed. However, that means that when you're cruising at altitude, you're carrying a very large, heavy wing around, which isn't actually necessary. You don't need the wing to be that big. And so you end up with extra drag and extra weight that you don't want. And so the question is, if we use distributed propulsion, like I've sketched on the right, can we have a smaller wing that's perhaps more efficient? And the way we would do this is whereas on the left, while well, we discussed before, the propeller and the wing don't really interact. On the right-hand side, we now have the whole span of the wing immersed in the jet from the propeller wash. And that propeller is gonna generate a high-speed jet. So I've labeled that as V-jet in the, in the diagram. And because the lift of the wing is proportional to the velocity of the jet squared or proportional to the velocity squared, we see an increase in lift. So as well as providing thrust, the propeller is now also uh, augmenting the lift to the wing and that might make it more efficient. One other thing I should discuss because we're looking at designing these aircraft with many leading edge propellers is what do we do with them at cruise? So we want them at takeoff and landing to increase the lift of the wing but we actually find from some analysis I did in my as part of my research 
Uh, we want to fold away most of the propellers during cruise, and that actually makes the uh, aircraft slightly more efficient. So the left-hand bar is the original aircraft, and the two on the right-hand side are, are distributed systems, one with and one without folding propellers. And the technology does exist to do this already, so it, so it is a feasible concept. Okay, so how do we model uh, distributed blowing? Well, we, in my project, one of the tools we use is something called computational fluid dynamics, which is a tool used a lot in industry and academia to model fluid flows. To uh, model the propellers, so I've shown here the wing, the cross-section of the wing, and to add in the propellers, we can just have a pressure jump upstream of the wing. And if you apply that pressure jump, you end up with a high-speed jet that flows over the wing, which is what we're seeing in the graph. And if we gradually increase the thrust, starting at zero, I can plot the lift on the right-hand side, and we see an increase in lift. And that's pretty much a linear relationship. So that's really interesting, that as well as the traditional uh, metrics or the standard metrics a pilot uses to control the lift of the wing, they've now also got the throttle lever, which just adds an extra degree of complexity. So distributed blowing adds an, this extra degree of freedom. And the aim of uh, my work, which in collaboration with Rob, is to try and see how that's going to uh, enhance the performance of the wing. Uh, so first of all, we need to come up with some sort of uh, way of assessing the performance of the wing uh, for different geometries. And I'm going to discuss that very briefly. So I already mentioned how the lift uh, of the wing scales with velocity squared. And we can imagine that the wing is sort of sat in this, this wash from the propeller with a local velocity v jet squared. And if I do some analysis, which I won't really go into detail here, we find that the lift is and the thrust are proportional to each other, which is just what we showed before in my simulations. So that's reassuring. Uh, we can also think about how the lift changes with uh, the deployment of flaps or the, the tilt of the aircraft. And that's very well understood at the moment uh, from aerodynamics. And there's a linear relationship over, over a range of angles up until something called the stall point, which is where flow starts to leave the surface of the wing and you tend to get vibration in the wing and a lot of uh, non-linear uh, characteristics that are quite bad for performance. So we tend to stay a long way away from the stall point and sit closer to the operating point, which I've marked in blue. So that's a much safer place to sit. And if I combine these equations together, I find that uh, the lift is both a function of the thrust and the flap angle. Uh, so we, and we can sit within this space. The pilot can change the thrust, they can deploy the flaps a bit more and change the lift of the wing. But to see what the maximum realizable lift is, we need to think about what areas are off limits to us. Uh, the first simple one is where the wing is stalling, like I just So uh, this map uh, with uh, different flap angles and different thrust settings. And that affects uh, the amount of lift that uh, the wing generates. And so first of all, we can remove where the wing is stalling. So I've hatched that area out. Uh, and any good engineer would also include a safety margin. So I'm going to gray out an area that's uh, sort of a, uh, uh, we could go in there if we had to uh, in an emergency situation, but in practice, you'll try to avoid that area. And then from my, my point of view, the most interesting uh, line, uh, sort of boundary, is actually this catch-22 situation that you have with blowing, that as you come into land, you want to reduce the thrust from the propellers because you need to slow down and, and stop eventually. But you've also got the problem that you need to blow the wing in order to generate enough lift to be able to land safely. Uh, and that leads to uh, a final set of lines where you basically want the thrust from the propellers to be less than the drag of the whole aircraft so that the aircraft can come to a standstill. And so I've marked that area off. Uh, there's one other boundary that I haven't really got time to discuss around where there's not really any benefit to doing the blowing. But what we do end up with at the end is this triangle shape, uh, which cuts off the, the available operating space for a pilot. So that's where they can sit. And uh, in this case, the top right-hand side gives a, a value of lift of, of three, which is the maximum that can be achieved for blowing. Uh, and actually, if I compare my analytical, simple sort of back of the envelope calculation to uh, what we'd get from simulations, we get a very similar, similar graph. Uh, so I can sort of go back and forwards once. And so although the physical numbers are slightly different and we do a lot of work in the lab on why that is the case, and I'd love to talk about it in more detail another time, uh, it's just interesting to see that actually the analytical and the numerical simulations do indeed line up. And in my work, what I do is I take the maximum 
lift that can be achieved, and then we look at that for many different geometries. And so I'm going to quickly run through that just for a few cases, just to wrap this presentation up. And what we see is that actually we want uh, quite small propellers positioned a long way below the wing center line, and that's the best possible for wing lift. And I've had to redact the numbers, I'm afraid, for uh, as sponsored by Rolls Royce, uh, but. Uh, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see that's where, where we want to sit. Uh, however, uh, sorry, I've skipped that. There, is, uh, there are some issues with sitting in that place, practical elements of the problem. First of all, if you have very large position, you end up with quite large nacelles because they're along below the wing center. And also if you have small propellers, you need a lot of nacelles to fill the whole span of the wing. And so that leads to a lot of uh, extra drag from the pods that hold the motors. And if I do a drag-based design rather than a lift-based design, I actually find that the optimum point is in a completely different location of the design space, um, which is very interesting. It sort of shows that when we're doing these new designs, we do still have to consider some of the practicalities of how we might actually achieve these designs because it really does make a big difference to, to the design space. And so this yellow area, I can take the numbers out and we've actually done this with the AIA that Rob was talking about, and we can include that into uh, an advanced technology section within the, uh, within the model. So in the model, you could click advanced technologies and you might choose to have a blown wing and you can see how that benefits the, uh, the aircraft. And we, it's not up and running at the moment, but some uh, data I've got shows that actually you get quite a significant benefit from having blown wings compared to conventional uh, technologies. Uh, so with that, I will end my talk and uh, me and Rob will take some questions, I think. Thank you. Thanks very much, George, and very, very well done for navigating that technical problem. I have one as well in that all of your screens are frozen, but since I can hear your voice, I assume that you're still there. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just going to ask if anybody wants to uh, raise a hand to ask a question to either Rob or George, please do. But in the meantime, I'm just going to look through the chat at some of the recovered questions. We've got one from Simona. Does the contrail uncertainty, um, oh, sorry, with um, hydrogen or hydrocarbon fuels dominate everything? And is there any difference between contrail uncertainty with hydrogen or CO2? That was for I can, one. I can answer that one. Can you stop sharing a sec, George? So we sure. can. So, so um, that's a good question. So um, the, 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 the level of uncertainty on the way we work. Um, on the contrail prediction is we have global um, uh, um, maps of contrail probability at different, different humidities and temperatures. And so you can fly a certain route and using the DLR co-kit model, it predicts the contrail on that route. So the kerosene one is the sort of best model available at the moment, but there is an uncertainty on it, a, a known uncertainty. Um, the hydrogen contrails are incredibly uncertain. The, 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 there aren't any, no one's done any flights with contrail modeling with hydrogen real flights. Um, all there is is numerical modeling and we've taken the best available data. But one of the really important things about the model is being able to switch between as a new model comes out from a particular research team, it's the ability to be able to switch to that model and see the consequence. The very last, bit about what, you've, what you asked, Simone, was that um, uh, the contrail uncertainty is very high compared to the other uncertainties, and it's a large effect. However, by changing the height at which you fly and using contrail avoidance, it's a much easier thing to target than the CO2 itself. So, so we, we have to keep that under consideration. It, it, it's the sort of, in a way, the easy bit to get at. Um, but, it, but it is very unknown. Lots of work needs to be done on it. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Um, we've got a, qu a question for George from Eric. So uh, with the improvements in propeller distribution uh, that you showed, what kind of improvement in range for electric aircraft do you expect to achieve? A great question. So I, I can't give exact numbers, but I'd say that in the somewhere in the range of around 20%, and you actually saw that from the uh, from the graph that I showed you right at the end, that you're getting around a 20% benefit. And that includes uh, the, the weight of the system and then also the benefits that I described in terms of 
my calculations. And there's that, there are other forms of distributed propulsion that I haven't touched on today, which also potentially could yield some benefits as well. So placing propellers close to the tips could see around 5% benefit. And then there's also a so called uh, modular ingestion, which is another type of distributed propulsion, uh, which will see some benefits. Just to add to George's point, what, one of the really interesting things is that if, if you switch to electric propulsion, but you allow the plane to stay exactly the same as a kerosene based plane, then no surprise, there's a massive a massive disadvantage with doing it. And it's only through the big system unlocks to allow you to exploit those new forms of propulsion that you, you really see the true benefits. So I think it's shown us that, that, that a systems process of analyzing is critical to this. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, I'll just quickly ask one, one of my questions. Um, does the climate impact um, uh, uh, analysis in the AIA, um, does that um, include modification of airports for hydrogen storage and new infrastructure for, for new fuels? Or does that come under the plant and fuel production bit? And did I just miss it hidden under there? Um, I was just interested in where that fits. Yeah, so um, at the moment, the model does not include the climate impact of building new airports. So it includes the entire production. So it's building all the plants to build the fuels, all the plants to build the batteries. Um, it includes that. It doesn't include the, it, it includes the difference in transport required to get it into the airport and use it in the airport in the plains but not the rebuild of the airport. And one of the things we need to look at in stage two is as the model starts to tell us how many airports in the world would have to be retrofitted with different fuels, you can start to see what the impact of that would be. But, but that, is a, that, that, is, that, that is challenging. One of the really interesting things is, you know, for instance, we put in the Qantas current fleet and you, you can either lock it to its current, current routes and see what technologies could do, or you could allow them to fly different routes to make up the same number of passenger journeys. And, and that's very different solutions come out of it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've been told that John Nolan has his actual hand up. <laughs> I'm afraid my screen is frozen, John, so I can't see you, but um, you're very welcome to ask a question to uh, Rob and George. I think you need to unmute yourself, John. Can you hear me? Well, I'm a very, very ancient Cambridge engineer, and my two questions are terribly simple. Can the pop-up messages stay on a bit longer? Second question, what is a contrail? Okay, I'll, I, I, I will defer to the uh, host for the pop-up message. Oh, the pop-up messages, you mean on Zoom or on the model? Well, some on Zoom, which come up the top of the screen, and sometimes they go off very quickly. So one was explaining what blue hydrogen was. Yeah. And being very, very ancient, I think blue hydrogen was long after my time. Okay, so I'll very quickly mention blue hydrogen and contrails. So the first one is contrails is the water vapour, which is left at altitude, oh. forms cirrus yes. cloud. And those cirrus cloud do two things. They trap heat in and they reflect some of the sun, sun's radiation. And so um, it's really interesting. At certain times of day and on certain routes, that effect can actually help climate change and on other routes it can make it very much worse and we've actually had quite some fun playing with rerouting to actually can anyone win from from these things but, it, but it's an interesting effect so blue hydrogen is where you um you actually make your hydrogen f from uh, kerosene or other fuels and then you capture the carbon and you store it the problem is that about 20% of the CO2 can't be captured and gets emitted, so it's not a perfect process. And on top of that, methane is released as part of the process. And any leak of methane, as you'll know, is an incredibly strong greenhouse gas. And the best publications on that, um, if you average, it's very dependent on the number of years you average over, but if you choose to average over 100 years, 
the effect of both that methane and the CO2 you can't remove is not far off the size of CO2 coming from flights at the moment. So it sort of shows that going through that carbon capture route um, for planes won't be advanta as advantageous uh, as for maybe other, other industries. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, John. Brilliant. Thanks very much to both Rob and George for those uh, absolutely fascinating talks. Um, I, feel, <laughs> I feel very uh, com confident that we can do something great with aviation for zero carbon. So that's really great. Um, the next talk is from Simona Hochgreb, who leads the Reactive Flows Group at the Department of Engineering. And Simona is going to talk about how to burn towards net zero. So Simona, you're very welcome to share your slides. And thanks again to Rob and George. Okay, hopefully you can see the slides. Okay, yeah. good. So um, usually those of us who have been working on improving existing devices that actually use fossil fuels <laughs> are the bad guys now. But, but I'm going to try to show you that uh, you know, we're, we're part of the solution uh, in, in this whole business. Um, as we know, uh, we're creatures of fire. Yeah? Without fire, we wouldn't be here. We'd have very small teeth and not be able to eat very much. And so our human evolution is entirely bound up with fire, except we use a lot more now than we used to. Um, and an illustration of that is uh, where we are still. Uh, over many years. This is, won't be news for, for those of you who are very familiar with the CO2 climate change problem, but we, we have a, a codependence on, on fossil fuels. And in fact, it hasn't gotten any better since we've known about climate change in, in the, the past 30 or 50 years, depending on how we count it. And so a lot of our energy um, either produces net CO2 or partial CO2 if you count uh, biofuels and, and waste as, as a way. Uh, of, of looking at that. Um, and, and of course, um, this is a huge install base, um, which uh, shifting that to, uh, to anything that is renewable is an enormous challenge, either uh, via solar or wind or, or anything. And so it's, it's quite likely that we continue to use these sources where we want to use them better or with fuels that don't produce as much uh, net CO2. Um, and, uh, you know, because we're talking about 90% combustion, even if you're talking about electrifying lots of things, then the things that produce electricity need to be uh, zero carbon. Where does all the carbon go? Uh, here we have uh, the, the fossil fuels. You can see the very thin lines are the things that don't involve combustion. So combustion is absolutely everywhere. And if we're every, everybody's very toasty in their homes right now or, or their colleges and so on, <laughs> that's still because we're producing uh, either electricity or, or burning gas directly. So uh, we use that uh, a lot. And um, if we look at where all that carbon is going, sorry, I'm just switching my, my, my screen so I can see the slides here. Um, <clears throat> uh, even when we talk about uh, where, where does that go, we see in, about a third of that is, is transport. Let me just go back on one slide. Oops. Things are frozen. No, not frozen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we look at uh, a third of it is industry, a third of it is transport, and a third of it is um, miscellaneous there. And so a big part of it is that uh, the distributed uses of uh, liquid fuels, for example, for transport are some of the hardest ones to, to shift. And uh, and even now, when we see a lot of the ground transport going towards uh, electrif electrification and, and battery uh, electric vehicles. Uh, this is not a solution unless the electricity production is decarbonized. So this is a picture for the whole world. If we look at the UK, um, the picture is slightly different. It's about a third transport, a third, uh, not quite a third, or 15% uh, industry directly. And then other, a lot of it is, is heating and other types of transformation. Um, and of course, UK is only one or two percent of the world, so we can have fantastic solutions that work in the UK, and we won't make a dent in the problem unless the solutions that we develop are, are useful everywhere um, in the world. 
And energy density, of course, is a key attribute for the adoption of any solution. I have here a very simplified picture of the energy that's available for uh, liquid fuels. So that's the best storage per unit volume, and that's why we, we like them so much. And even though we, you might talk about um, things that might have higher efficiency than certain types of engines and so on, uh, you're not talking about an order of magnitude change. You, you're talking about uh, maybe a factor or two, but that still doesn't get to it uh, where we want to be in terms of energy density. When we look at hydrogen, hydrogen has excellent uh, storage per unit mass, and that's why you know, it potentially could be considered for aviation because it doesn't weigh very much in terms of total energy but it has very poor volumetric storage capabilities. So if we think about a, a standard 200 bar uh, cylinder, it can go up maybe to 700 bar, depending on what, what materials you have. Uh, you're still talking about let's say, something that might be comparable to a battery, so, so not great. And there are other potential candidates that, that people have been talking about, which are all blue, let's say, in terms of uh, total carbon produced, uh, in the sense that they, they can reduce the amount of, of CO2 that is produced per unit energy but not completely uh, eliminated. And uh, all those three solutions uh, would be in general um, quite uh, not energy dense. Oops. So all the gases typically have four volumetric density. And so we're looking at either sticking with the liquids, doing something with very high efficiency for, for hydrogen, um, or maybe producing additional fuels. And the batteries, hopefully they'll continue to come along in terms of storage. But at the moment, we're still in a solution where if you're talking about electrification, uh, batteries are good for a short range. And when you're talking about uh, vehicles that can be uh, charged, but not good really for uh, very long storage. So we're talking about gigawatt months, which would be necessary for say seasonal storage. And the reason why hydrocarbons have been so successful in, uh, in, in being used is that they, they are super efficient energy storage. So fossil fuels have, have a lot of energy. Uh, they're very simple. Um, and also the simplest and lightest way from, from fuel to motion uh, has been thermomechanical conversion. So even if you have electromechanical conversion, there are few fuels that can go directly um, from from fuel to, to motion as producing hot air, which is what uh, all combustion devices uh, aim to do. If we now go to decarbonizing strategies, and uh, as we see, for example, in the growth of uh, passenger vehicles over the past few years, dramatically so, uh, including and especially uh, in China, we can see that in, there's a very high market penetration. And so we expect that to to, to grow over the years, but that will have very little effect in terms of climate change unless we do something about decarbonization of, of electricity. And that uh, you can see in this picture, for example, some projections of what would happen if you electrified uh, the vehicles uh, today, or in, in the case of the studies to 2013 in China, uh, which is very small impact because a lot of the power is being produced by a coal. And with projections, for example, for 2030, that would be larger. For Europe, the, the picture looks a little bit better today and potentially will look even better in 2030 if you electrify not just uh, vehicles, but also all of uh, trains and ship things to public transport and, and so on. But of course, the key to that is being able to decarbonize electricity, which depends on being able to produce electricity from renewables. And we all know that renewables, uh, including solar, wind, uh, tidal, uh, are intermittent. And that requires us to have some type of storage. Um, there have been many different considerations of storage, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, the chemical type of storage, where we talk about e-fuels that might be produced, for example, from renewables. And that means that can be anything from, as Rob was talking about, uh, the green hydrogen, which can be directly produced, for example, by electrolysis. Uh, or it could be combining that with CO2 from some other source, could be an, an alternative power plant, and then uh, using uh, a lot of chemistry, fischer tropsch for example, or other processes to produce uh, liquid fuels, which then can be stored for a long term. Uh, you can also store hydrogen and the oxygen itself uh, over, over time. 
And potentially you can do that at the scale that you might need, uh, for example, for seasonal storage, where you're talking about weeks, uh, not just days, uh, and therefore batteries are not quite enough. So there's a place there for a variety of different e-fuels. But of course, there's a price to be paid for, uh, for that, whether you're talking about uh, producing these combined processes, uh, fish tropes and so on, you're talking about maybe three to five, three to five percent, um, three to five times the input energy uh, for, for liquids and maybe two times uh, for that uh, for hydrogen. However, if it was really quotes free, then potentially there's, there's room for that. Um, so the second advantage, of course, is that uh, everything that burns is already there. So you don't need any new infrastructure for using these different fuels. How much do we know about burning methane or methanol? Obviously, gasoline or e-diesels, all of those would be straight replacements with, without any problems. Um, they're expensive uh, uh, in terms of both energy and, and total cost, but they're there. But then we can consider some of these alternatives, for example, hydrogen, ammonia, and uh, various ethers, for example, that could be uh, used, but they still require some additional infrastructure and additional development. And, and in particular, they also require some development of how to how to burn those uh, reliably in a variety of different commercial devices. And I won't talk about ammonia today, but one of them is, is hydrogen. And I'll just tell you a couple of the um, issues, let's say, with, with hydrogen. If we look at uh, something called the laminar flame speed, which is a measure of the reactivity of the fuel, uh, for our hydrocarbons, they live in, in this little box there. They burn uh, over, over a certain range, and they have uh, flame speeds of the order of centimeters per second. And if we talk about hydrogen, uh, it's very, very reactive. It burns over a very wide range, and uh, that offers very wide flammability limits as well as a very high burning rate. That can be a very good thing in terms of how much power per unit volume I'll be able to pack with hydrogen fuel devices. On the other hand, there are safety issues as well that need to be uh, dealt with. However, I think from, from what industry tells us, uh, that's relatively well controlled, certainly in all the chemical processes that, that are run. Um, perhaps a different picture if you have it very widespread with storage uh, everywhere. Second thing about hydrogen is that uh, it's a very weird fuel, not just it very burns fast, but it's also very sensitive to conditions such as turbulence that you might have in a flow, this is a, um, a plot of turbulence, and this is the, uh, the ratio of the turbulence enhancement to what we think the theory says the turbulence enhancement should be. Um, and so we see that for, for methane, that's uh, about one, so we, we think we understand how, how methane burns. But for hydrogen, we have all this extra sensitivity to, to turbulent combustion there that we have yet to understand. And that's one of the projects that we've been uh, working on, which is trying to understand how these little balls of flames burn uh, with, with hydrogen. Hydrogen is extremely high diffusivity because it's a very, um, very light fuel, and that's what gives it a very high flame speed. It also tends to burn in, not as a flame sheet, a very simple sort of Bunsen flame type behavior, but it, it, it protrudes everywhere and it gives a, a very different kind of combustion, which has not been explored very much. So we want to explore that using both the computational method uh, as well as uh, experimental method. And I'll just tell you a little bit about how, how that goes. Uh, it's possible to measure uh, what the flame is doing using a variety of techniques to map out where OH, which is one of the intermediates in the combustion of, of hydrogen is and, and where temperature is. Um, using some lasers to probe the spectroscopy, uh, as well as the density of, of the flow. And then we can measure essentially how these surfaces behave and then compare that to simulations. In the, the left, this is methane and this is methane in the same conditions. This is simulation and this is experiment. So that looks quite familiar. And then what we haven't done is measure that with hydrogen. So that's one of the things that we're looking for. Uh, and these are the simulations that show that it burns in a very convoluted way that we don't quite understand. Um, and I just have two more slides that I want to show how other types of combustion might be able to help and where we don't quite understand what's going on. Um, people have proposed the so-called uh, grad cycle for, for burning oxyfuels in general, but in particular for, for hydrogen oxygen, where if you have hydrogen and oxygen, you can burn that in a combustor in a conventional gas turbine oops, cycle. Um, 
And because hydrogen and oxygen, if you put them on their own, they will burn at extremely high temperatures. Then you need to diffuse to dilute that with uh, steam, typically, which is what we produced in the gas turbine. And then you compress that back and you dilute uh, that the whole situation. And with a cycle like that, after you put a, a load of um, uh, heat exchangers here and there, you are able to get potential cycle efficiencies of, of the order of 60%, although that hasn't yet been built, but it's, it's one of the ideas. A potential alternative that we've been looking at now is to think about using high pressure electrolysis, which then directly would give you 40 bar hydrogen oxygen. So that means that you don't have to uh, compress hydrogen oxygen, which is very expensive. And instead you use just compression of water, which is very inexpensive, and then use an aerosol spray for cooling to avoid steam compression. That might give a much more compact, uh, so low, lower cost solution. Um, we haven't yet calculated what the relative uh, uh, efficiency of that would be, and that's an on, ongoing uh, project where we're looking at the sensitivities of that. And then finally, we're looking at uh, using combustion for producing uh, battery type materials. Uh, some of the new materials that are being considered for batteries are these uh, carbon metal oxides and NMCs, nickel manganese cobalt uh, compounds using lithium. And typically what we want is for these uh, materials to be coated with carbon, which has a very good electrical conductivity. And uh, that potentially could be a process where we get a one step production of these micron size uh, particles, which potentially could be, could combine the ability of these metal oxides to store energy with a very good carbon conductivity. So that's another project that we've been working on. And I can't tell you too much about it because we're just starting to do the experiments now. So I'll just take some questions now. Thank you very much, Simona. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to start off with a question in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, this is from Eric. To decarbonize home heating, it's sometimes suggested we could replace gas boilers for hydrogen boilers and use the existing gas network to pipe hydrogen directly into people's homes. How feasible is this a solution? Yeah, so uh, lots of talk about that. It's, it's entirely feasible uh, in the sense that it's possible to convert and there have been various uh, boiler manufacturers and so on who have demonstrated that. Um, so it's, it's not pie in the sky. And, and of course, before we had natural gas, we had town gas, which was half hydrogen have CO, so uh, it, it's a potentially less uh, dangerous <laughs> than having hydrogen CO coming to your house. I think the, the counter argument for that is that, um, you know, if, if you were to do that, that, that's totally fine. I think the process of producing hydrogen would not necessarily be uh, free in terms of the total energy that you, that you spend. And I think it sort of it would break even with using directly natural gas at the moment. However, if you were to do that in central locations where you use hydrogen <laughs> to produce electricity in some way, it could be a gas turbine, it could be uh, fuel cells, and so on, then uh, then you would electrify the the the, the whole um, of heating. But again, it's an issue of infrastructure. The infrastructure for for distributing gas is there. Uh, in principle, there's no reason why you can't mix um, methane with natural gas if it was the right price and the right energy mix and the right carbon mix. Um, you'd, you'd have to tune all the boilers because they would work differently. But, you know, so it's not something that you do lightly. Um, and it was done 100 years ago. <laughs> so maybe, maybe there will be another 100 years. Uh, well, maybe this is the time to do it again, but uh, I think the, the, economic, the economics of it are not favorable at the moment. So I don't think that that will, ha that will happen. Thank you, Simona. I've got a very quick question from me. Um, so drop-in fuels, people tend to think of them as just an interim solution. What headroom is there for improving the conversion efficiencies? Because they look like they they look very uh, sort of easy solutions where we don't have to change any infrastructure, but the yields are not so good. Or do you think that that's something that is more like an economic investment problem or a scaling problem? Uh, well, the yields in, in energy are not so good. So you, you have to put a lot of yes, energy sorry, to, yeah. uh, to, to produce the e-fuels now. And so it's, it's not, unless you have really 
free energy <laughs> where, where it makes it possible and, and, and useful for you to, to make your fuels. It's not yet something that uh, could be considered. But from the point of view of technically being drop in, many of these fuels are literally drop in. You know, so, so all the Fisher Tropsch fuels are, um, and there's no reason why, why you can't use them. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Simona. That was a really fascinating talk and some, what a diverse mix of a research your group does. That's really, really exciting. Um, we've got our next speaker now, Adrian Fisher. So Adrian's from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Eric is going to present Adrian's slides because uh, I think Adrian's got um, te technical problems like me. <laughs> Adrian's talk is entitled Carbon Neutral Chemical Manufacturing. Uh, thanks very much, Lars. So yeah, I, I, my internet speed here is more dial-up than broadband, so uh, let's see how we go. But uh, thanks very much for the kind uh, kind introduction today. And um, so we've been hearing actually uh, in, in all of the talks about electrification of fuels, but producing fuels via electrolysis. And, and this talk, I was going to delve in a little bit at some of the technical challenges that accompany that. And, and the work we're gonna talk about is around an activity that's been carried out in CARES, this, this Singapore part of Cambridge, uh, which is focused on carbon reduction technologies and also some collaborations we've had over in another sort of Cambridge center in, in, in China. So Eric, if we could do the next one, please. And so we're, um, we're in a, a transitional situation. We, we have uh, renewable electricity coming onto the grid. We've already heard there's a lot of uh, issues around intermittency there and how do we manage that. And uh, manufacturing, chemical manufacturing and manufacturing in a whole countries around about 18% uh, to the world CO2 emissions. And in the chemical side, um, we have some options with these, with these electrons, these low carbon electrons, where we can directly use them to produce chemicals. And, and of course, we, we're very familiar with the idea of uh, splitting water. Most of us have, have done that, but actually there are many chemicals. In fact, pretty much every chemical that we, we use day to day could be made directly using an electrochemical approach because essentially all we're doing when we're doing chemical reactions is we're redistributing charge under a potential which is what we do in an electrochemical cell but we wire two terminals to do that and so we can think of using intermittent electricity supply and, and storing storing energy perhaps in, in, in hydrogen as a, as a vector, but we could also make any other chemical that we, we might want as well. And so we've been looking at some low hanging fruits some at some chemistry that could be done to help with the transition and move away from what are essentially a high pressure, high temperature sort of technologies in, in chemical industry at the moment, which actually have been, been optimized fantastically. They really are very energy efficient within their own bounds with a little bit of residual temperature uh, in the systems that could still be captured, but not much. And so if we're gonna decarbonize or at least you know, reduce the carbon content in, in chemical manufacturing, we're going to th need to think about new approaches. And so I, I was, today I was gonna illustrate a few examples, but also highlight some of the challenges that we face you know, at a technical level. So um, Eric, if we move on to the next one. And it, currently actually, if we look at the chemicals you can buy off the shelf, you know, and they, there's around about 50% of those contain uh, a product which comes from an electrolysis uh, reaction. It's called the electrolysis of brine. We take salt water, we electrolyze it, we form chlorine, uh, sodium hydroxide, and, and hydrogen. And, and that's a precursor. It's used it's in the manufacturing of around about 50% of the chemicals. And so this is an electrolysis process. It uses it is between two and, and 4,000 billion kilowatt hours directly or if you integrate across all the different aspects of the, the supply chain. Um, so it's a big electricity uh, user, but nevertheless, it, it, it is in a very energy efficient uh, conversion process, taking what's essentially just a salt water supply and producing chemicals that are of value. And what's interesting about the electrochemical approaches is, is that when we typically see a large petrochemical plant, we, we start with a, a small scale reaction in a lab and then we, we scale it by making those reactors absolutely enormous. And, and, the, and the challenges that we come across in the lab are very different to those that we then um, come across when we do a scaled plant. On the right hand side, there are a couple of pictures, one of a large scale uh, 
electrolyzer for this process and one of a small and actually the difference between the two is just the number of plates we use we, we don't we don't build larger and larger electrolyzers we just make more plates we we number up rather than scaling up and so in this technology area it's kind of interesting to we can we can take ideas and concepts from the laboratory of very small pilot scale and translate them to industry, industrial scale relatively straightforwardly we do have issues in terms of connectivity of, of each of the cells as it were um, but these are not hugely different to that that we're managing day to day uh, and there are other uh, electrochemical processes that we use that, that allow us to get our products um, aluminium is produced electrochemically uh, in Norway has a large aluminium manufacturing plant and they, they are, that plant is situated next to a, a hydroelectric facility so renewable electricity is used for this high electron requirement and electrochemistry is, is to some extent limited by the price of the electrons. So if we think about, say, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide used to be produced electrochemically, but, but it isn't anymore. It's produced uh, using a relatively high energy pathway, high temperature, high pressure pathway, which uses far more, it emits far more carbon dioxide, but it's not cost uh, effective to produce it electrolytically uh, in, in the current models anyway, because the cost of electricity is, is, is high. So electrochemical processes have been used historically and even now in, in industry to produce chemicals. But with the, with the idea that we will have an intermittency of supply and that we'll have potentially electrons at, at, at times where we can't simply use all of the supply, these, these processes become quite interesting and an, an opportunity to decarbonize some of our chemical manufacturing. So Eric, if we could probably go on the next one. And just a few concepts, a few ideas that have been floating around and are actually happening at the moment. Um, Honda the, uh, have got this idea of a fueling station for fuel cell powered vehicles, not, not necessarily battery powered on the left hand side. And here, what they do is they store the, the hydrogen in the form of water. So there's a tank underneath this, this electrolyzer effectively, which is water. So we don't, we're not storing hydrogen, which can be challenging. We're storing the hydrogen in the form of water, something we can easily manage. And then we have an electrolyzer, which has a, a certain amount of charge storage, which is ideally produced from the solar panels, which are on the top there, or renewable electricity, which is coming in from the grid. And then your car in the, of the future will phone this station as it arrives. It will, you know, the station will produce the, the, the hydrogen that's needed and it will then, the car will take that and then, and then move on. So we, we, we're moving from a mass manufacturing idea to a localized manufacturing and on, on demand. So we're no longer running a plant 24 hours a day to produce a very particular chemical, which is shipped around. Now we're making a chemical locally on demand and, and, and in using it. And so that business model is really quite different to the current one. And, and, and that's something we're going to see more uh, sort of adaption as the businesses move to these electrochemical processes. Um, the middle picture there is, is the US Navy. And we've already heard about electrofuels. Actually, they, they claim that they, it's cheaper for them to manufacture their fuel for their jet fighters on board. Uh, they have a nuclear uh, reactor on board. So they have in, infinite numbers of electrons, as it were. And so they use that to split water, and then they do a water gas shift reaction, which we've heard a little bit about earlier, capture carbon dioxide from some source and then make the fuel that they need. Not only does that bring them uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper fuel, but it also brings sec fuel security in the sense that they can make the fuel where they need it. They don't have to be reliant on going back to, to get the fuel. So alongside this localized production of chemicals comes a, a range of other opportunities and securities which we are for more familiar with thinking in electricity supply than, than necessarily fuel although well, that's beginning to become more clear i guess um, the right hand side is a, a picture which is related to the next next space exploration we, we're going to see um astronauts returning to the moon in, in 20, 2023 2024 and they're going to be going to the north north pole which is it's pretty dark it's pretty cold uh, but they're actually going and they're hunting for ice and they're hunting for ice because, of course, where there's ice, there's fuel. And if we are to explore beyond the Earth and, 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 and out into our solar system, one of the things we're going to need is to be able to access fuel. And if we do have uh, bases located on the moons or, or, other, or the other planets, then we will need a supply of fuel. And so ice is very important alongside the solar panels that allow us to generate the electricity to split the water. So these are areas that are kind of niche and ongoing at the moment and, and beginning to find a, a way in the world. Um, on the next slide, Eric. 
things. And so what are the challenges? Uh, well, uh, electrochemistry is in principle fairly straightforward. We have electrons that come out of a, an electrode under some sort of potential or driven by some sort of voltage. Um, but there are many steps in that electricity chain in terms of reaction, mass transfer, and many other stages that, that can limit our efficiency. And so one of the things we're interested in is using some of the mathematical tools that are around. So to try and identify what are the, the key parameters. The parameters on the right are, are highly nonlinear. They, they, they interact with one another. They're, they're, they're very, uh, very difficult to pin down in a chemical manufacturing process. And so we're interested in identifying what are the key ones and what ones are going to affect the performance long term so that we can control those well if we were to do take these through all these processes through into chemical manufacturing and we've looked at that for electrofuels we looked at it for hydrogen and we looked at it for an another couple of chemicals that we've been working on and in most cases what happens is it, it's to do with the mechanistic aspects the sensitivity of the chemical reactions to potential in, in certain parts of the pathway of the reactions so that helps us to design more efficient systems and understand how to control them as we go um, on the next slide, uh, and just as we saw the computational fluid dynamics being used, packages being used for uh, the flights and, 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 and lift, we can also do a similar thing in the electrochemical field and look at the, the movement and the, and the potential and the electrical characteristics in a device. And these are important because we, we want to be able to control very specifically what's going on at that electrode interface if we're to get a very, very, uh, you know, defined product. And one of the challenges is that we drive an electrochemical reaction. The, the resistance in the system means that our electrode, although it may only be a meter square or something like that, actually the potential on one part will be quite different to another. And so we end up with different reactions going on on different sites. And so the question is, how can we control that? And we've worked with some of the control engineers in, um, in Cambridge, losing some of the aspects that allow us to control aircraft and, and, and make sure they're stable in flight and use some of those control strategies in a similar way to feed back into the, the potential distribution, the control of the voltage across an electrode as, as it proceeds and we drive a chemical reaction. So Eric, do you mind the next one? Thanks. And so this is a kind of path of how you might develop a, a new system. At the center there is effectively a picture saying that we use this analysis tool at each of these stages to optimize the electrical characteristics of the system. And in the top right is a catalyst. Of course, this is important. It defines the chemistry that we do. Um, as an electrochemist, though, that's not only a catalyst, it's got to be electrically connected throughout the, the network to allow electrons to come in and out of that interface. And what we do is we build those materials and we pop them onto electrodes. And you can see at the bottom there in the middle, a series of plates, as it were. And they are anodes or cathodes or combinations of both, which are loaded with different catalysts. And then as we move to the left hand side, we stack those to give us the quantity to allow us to get the quantity of material that comes out build them into electronic systems and then test them in a, in a kind of cycle and the analysis we do in the middle there is to try and help us understand the performance of each of those steps as we take a material build it into a device and then see what the the yields and the products are and so we can we keep going around in that cycle until we get something that we hope works better and so that, that's a general step, but we can work this for many different chemical processes, hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide and, and many other chemical steps. So if we could do the next slide, Eric, please. Thanks. So this is just a, a micrograph of a very particular material. It's, uh, it's being used for what's called HER, so hydrogen evolution reaction, and it's a molybdenum disulfide. And um, we can see from those, those four slides that even though we've got the same material, we've got very different structure. And actually those structures mean that reactivity, the efficiency of the electron uh, and, the, and the sort of evolution of hydrogen is very different. So it's not just the actual electrical material that we use, it's the, the shape and the form of it, the crystal facets, how they're connected into the system. They all have an enormous effect on the overall operating efficiency and, and in many cases, the actual chemical product that you get. And so this represents a big challenge. And, and one of the areas we work on is how do you understand those structure potential reactivity relationships and build up libraries of 
what would a particular material do under a particular set of electrical conditions to yield the, the product that we want. And these have an enormous effect, just as they do in the battery field, in terms of improving the electrical efficiency of a battery. If we want to improve the efficiency of hydrogen production, this is something they have to have a lot of control over. And that's one of the areas that the group has been working on. Um, on the next slide. Uh, and we, we just actually heard in the last really nice last talk about um, using pressure to perhaps overcome some of the challenges of hydrogen production. And this is a facility that we have over in CARES in, in, in Singapore. And it's a micro system in the sense that we're, we're working on relatively small scales, but it allows us to look at temperature and pressure variations as we, as we deliver liquids onto liquids, gases onto liquids, gases onto gases, etc. cetera. It's a, it's a very versatile facility. And in, in the center there, I think you can see that there's more than one module. So actually what we're doing is we're making hydrogen when we want it, and we're delivering it to another component, which is actually CO2 system. And then those CO2 and the hydrogen are reacting and under, under a well-defined way to form another product. So again, we're making the amount of hydrogen we want locally, and we're delivering the amount of material we want. Maybe it's carbon dioxide to that hydrogen to allow a chemical reaction to go on and then use it. So very different to how we manufacture at the moment. Thanks, Eric. That's perfect timing. Um, beyond um, beyond the uh, world of, of hydrogen and, uh, and fuels, there are many other interesting products. Uh, I know there was a talk recently on ammonia in, in this, a very nice talk on, on this. So I won't talk too much about this particular slide, but uh, ammonia, 1% of the world's CO2 emissions in the harbour process. How, how can we address that? Uh, well, the harbour process, again, is extremely well tuned. So if we want to address that as a, as a chemical vector, if you like, then we're going to have to find new pathways. And, and the tools we use to help us under, understand the mechanisms of, the, of, these, of these reactions. And also um, testing through that reactor I showed you earlier allows us to then begin to consider other pathways to generate ammonia from the starting products that you have in, an, in a, in a harbour process uh, in, 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 usually. So the direction of reaction is very different, but the product we end up with is the same and, and, and it's much lower energy pathway ideally. Um, alongside, the, alongside the anode typically of the reactants, there's a, we have two terminals in the electrochemical system and often the auxiliary chamber, the secondary electrode is, is, is ignored. Um, but of course it's an electrical circuit and so the efficiency of a device is only as good as the overall hole. And so we work also on the, the, the counter chamber, trying to make sure the efficiency of that is working well. And that might, might typically be oxygen reduction, for example, or something like that. And so this is a slide sort of illustrating the importance of the, we have a, a, in an electrochemical system, we have a cell, we have two terminals, the reaction proceeds, but both terminals could be the rate determining step in terms of what we want to produce. And so we want to make sure that the, the auxiliary electrode, the one that's not really producing a chemical we may want, is, is, is not limiting that. Eight okay, minutes, Eric, one minute left. One more minute. I think I'm pretty much done. Eric's been keeping me well to speed, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to finish on this one. It's, um, it's an interesting idea. We always think that we need to put in energy, electricity, you know, to, to make the chemicals. But actually, uh, a fuel cell it is a chemical producer. Um, and in that case, of course, we feed maybe hydrogen and oxygen in and we generate electricity, um, but we also generate a chemical product. Now, in a traditional fuel cell, that'll be water. And the, the very bottom slide there is of a fuel cell, which was, it was actually developed in chemical engineering many years ago, even, you know, even before I was born. Um, and it, it was the fuel cell that was used to take uh, uh, humans to the, to the moon. And in that system they actually drank the product from the fuel cell the water the astronauts drank that um, and so actually there's a whole different way of thinking about this where we actually change the catalysts on our on our fuel cells and we we make chemical products that we want by feeding in a, a particular reactants and, and and we generate electricity because the driving force is a chemical and so we have many different opportunities in this technology area not only to change and lower the carbon content that's required to produce chemical manufacturing, but maybe completely turn it on its head and produce chemicals of value whilst generating electricity. So on that thought, I will leave everybody. I hope I've, uh, I, I look forward to asking any, answering any questions you may have. 
Uh, thanks so much, Adrian. That was fantastic. I've got a very quick question from Simona before we move on. And what electroactive yet energy dense materials other than hydrogen are low hanging fruit for storage? I, I guess that slightly depends on how you mean storage. Um, very nice question. Um, I, I, I'm very interested in things like hydrogen peroxide. Now, that, that's a chemical that we can use um for disinfection and many other processes and it just simply comes from water plus oxygen so we can take that as a, a vector and use it to store electricity and then release it when, when we want um, the electrofuels are a big area of course this this, this sort of uh, carbon content from carbon dioxide and, uh, and hydrogen and there's a big project around ethylene at the moment in the in the cares labs and taking ethylene and taking it through to glycerols and, and, and other high um, alcohol content materials okay thank you um uh, i think we've got enough time for the other bit of simona's question are the main limits for hydrogen electrolysis associated with the electrode over potentials or membrane breakthrough issues etc that's that's a good set of questions um so the, the production of hydrogen is heavily limited in terms of the uh, overall process. It, it's trying to over control the electropotential, the distribution and the overpotential. So if you look in the literature, there's substantial work, of course, around how do we improve the catalytic efficiency and electrical characteristics of the systems to drive that down. That, that's a big part. There will always be crossover issues and with hydrogen the containment of hydrogen is not not trivial right so there, there will always be a technical issue in the handling of hydrogen and the storage of hydrogen because it's yeah this is a tricky material to, to, to manage okay fantastic thank you so much adrian um if you don't mind just popping into the chat because i think there's a couple more questions there sure. if you okay. want to give them in um, the solutions in, in written form. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Lezak. So Stephen's a PhD student at the Scott Polo Research Institute and his uh, talk is entitled Does the World Still, Still Need Gold Mining? So Stephen, please share your slides. I'm looking forward to this one. <laughs> thanks, and thanks Eric and thanks everyone for organizing. Um, I am I'm the first social scientist to go today, which is a, a, a big weight on my shoulders, but I'm I'm grateful to be here with you all. I, I'm wondering, I, I can't see most of us, but um, could people go ahead and pop into the chat where they're calling in from right now? I'm, I'm curious how much of a Cambridge crowd we have, how much of a international crowd we have at the moment. Uh, oh, I can answer that for you. I've got a feeling everyone's Cambridge. <laughs> amazing. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm on Lensfield Road right now at the Scott Polar Research Institute. Um, most of my research has to do actually with the Arctic, so don't be fooled by the large map of Antarctica behind me. But uh, a lot of what I do, oh, we have Orkney in Germany. Okay, we're not all Cambridge. We have some good representation here. Um, <laughs> Orkney, man, I'm jealous of that. But a, a large part of my, uh, of my work is adjacent to um, the extractive industries. And, um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of work being done right now within the mining sector generally and, and extractive industries as well to decarbonize. And uh, it's important and oftentimes encouraging work. We've seen in the last couple of years, some of the world's first all electric mines come online. We've seen huge, huge innovations in how to make um, minerals like aluminum and steel using extremely uh, or relatively low energy intensive processes. But this is still a set of industries and technologies that account for, depending on how you want to measure it, about 10 or 12 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So a, a huge share of the overall pie. And I was working on this particular problem with some colleagues and, and we started to wonder with limited resources available in the world, is there a point at which we should be a little critical in asking, is everything worth abating in the first place? That is, do we just wanna take the economy of 2005 
and decarbonize it with an even focus on all of our efforts in terms of where we're seeking to move along that marginal abatement cost curve, the cheapest, most effective ways to switch over to low carbon energy use. And we wanted to start with gold to, to ask a question that's been asked before of other materials, but so far had not made its way into the actual commodities industry or particularly the mining sector. And so some background, because just talking about gold is a weird thing. If you take all of the world's above ground gold stocks, everything in bank vaults, everything in jewelry, everything in central reserves, if you were to melt it down into one cube, that cube would measure 22 meters on each side, which when I think about it seems like a remarkably small thing. This is something that has caused uh, you know, the literal conquest of continents. And, and yet it's, you know, smaller than many, 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 many buildings that we might walk past on an average day. And it tells us a little something about uh, sort of the nature of human desire, particularly when we think that this is, is something that has been pursued, not for uh, uh, any particular industrial utility, because at the end of the day, people really like shiny things. Uh, and, and that's been a driving force for thousands of years of human history. So it's with that that I encourage us all to ask on a finite planet, uh, are we allowed to think a little disobediently here? And rather than just look at where demand is coming from in global markets, to open ourselves up to the idea that maybe something is actually not so necessary in the first place. And this was the question that we ended up looking into. We started by thinking about two parallels, coal and ivory. And ivory is a, a sort of easier example in that it's something that most people in the world have decided this is so destructive to produce that we just shouldn't make it at all. And the world has had notable but limited success in essentially stigmatizing ivory production and consumption to the point where the market for it is significantly reduced from what it would be otherwise. And we can see that we're moving toward a similar place with coal production, where we're starting to see a divestment from coal. We're looking at activists and even central politicians calling for the complete banning of coal production altogether. And coal, unlike ivory production, is not associated so clearly with the death of a large charismatic megafauna. But we're understanding its environmental impact is huge. And we're saying that both because of the availability of substitutes and uh, because of the limited utility that coal generates, although we could argue about that, just saying that the, the costs outweigh the benefits. And that's a place where I think we can all agree in five or 10 years, we're gonna see a growing consensus around that. So I wanna ask, and, and it's a real question, is gold any different? Um, gold mining alone is responsible for 0.3% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is, roughly equal to all intra-European aviation pre-COVID. You add up the emissions of every single flight that was taken from one European destination to another, we're using the same emissions to mine coal, or sorry, to mine gold. You have 4 million people living with mercury poisoning because of gold mining, an absolutely astounding amount of water consumption. Uh, across the world, particularly in the global south, you see mining related violence and land dispossession and ecosystem destruction. Uh, these, are, um, these are issues that are rampant and have been inexorable, even despite 30, 40, 50 years of concerted work on improving the environmental and social performance of mining. We've seen very little actual gains in terms of the lived on the ground experience of people. 
uh, much of what has just happened is we've actually displaced mining from well-regulated geographies in the global north to less well-regulated geographies in the global south, where either the legal infrastructure is very weak uh, or the legal infrastructure doesn't particularly exist. So the natural question for us to ask was what would happen if we just stopped gold mining? And we realized that this had not been asked before in the literature that we could find. Uh, and we drew up a real back of the envelope model, but one that informed a lot of where we went from here. So we started by figuring out what gold is used for. And we were surprised to find that it's about half for jewelry and the other almost half sits in bank vaults where it is a store of value. Only 7% of annual gold demand ends up in technology or medicine or other applications. So from that, we built a little bit of a model and it's pretty simple. It's just stocks and flows. So on the left, you have all of the world's above ground gold stocks. Everything that has been dug up basically in human history. Gold is um, almost unique among materials in that it is never thrown away. And so it, it, it just sticks around. Um, most of the world's gold is in jewelry or, or almost half of it, followed closely by investment. And then industrial gold is like the stuff that's in our phones or in medicine or in anything else. And then uh, what you see on the right here, this is drawn to scale, you have annual demand uh, represented by the size of these bubbles. And so it's a little bit that's going into industrial uses uh, and the vast majority is bought up as a store of value or for jewelry. Now, recycling already meets about one third of this global demand, uh, which is a, an amazing thing. It's something like 1% of the, wor the world's gold is recycled every single year. It has probably the, it's probably as a, as a share of its total stock, one of the most recycled minerals in the world. And we just modeled a world where, um, I'm sorry, my Zoom is getting in the way. I modeled, we modeled the world where we stopped buying gold to stick it in bank vaults, which is, is a, a dream. Just this idea that suddenly uh, a, a bar of gold was like a Monet. There's never gonna be another Monet that's generated. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't make it any less valuable. It just means that people have to purchase existing Monets and trade it among themselves. And what we found is that if central banks and, um, and private investors were to stop buying new gold for investment, you would be able to cut global mining or demand for new gold by more than half. Already something that just as a thought experiment, we said, okay, so that would have losers in that gold mining companies would lose a huge amount of the value available to them. But it would also have significant winners in that if you already happen to have a bar of gold sitting under your mattress, it just got much more valuable. Uh, and so that the core economic political functions of gold would be able to withstand that, that kind of shift, that paradigm change. But we wanted to take it a step further. And we said, what if you just had no new mining? What would the world look like? And we're not suggesting that this is where anyone gets to, but we wanted to imagine it. And we found that all of the demand for industrial gold would continue to be met in perpetuity if you reduced demand for jewelry gold by about two thirds, which is a remarkable thing. And we didn't want to judge demand for jewelry gold because being good social scientists, we understand that this is something that has an important role in cultural and religious rights. And who are we, frankly, to say whether or not people should have gold jewelry? But given the availability of substitutes like gold that is alloyed with, uh, you know, other metals such as silver or copper, um, we were able to find that, you know, you could stop mining gold altogether 
And if you maintained existing recycling flows of 1,200 tons a year, you would be able to meet industrial demand in perpetuity and still have a reasonable surplus to allocate for jewelry, as long as you weren't having investment. So we wanted to ask what a world would look like in which you had gold mining being stigmatized and generally walked away from in the same way that coal mining is being stigmatized and, and walked away from. And I like to bring up Occam's razor here uh, because we're asking questions that are not about how we decarbonize an incredibly complex value chain, but just asking what if we stopped because in many ways we already are recycling as much gold as we really need for essential functions across the entire world. Uh, and so just to review the quick sort of interventions here, we're already seeing consumer preferences start to move toward recycled gold, which is a very new thing. And we're also seeing uh, the very early stages of a commodity market that'll be split into high carbon products and low carbon products which will create a further incentive for people to produce gold, primarily from recycled sources or from very low carbon mines. And it'll increase the relative price of very high carbon inefficient gold mines and maybe put some of them out of business. On the supply side, it will be really interesting to see whether we'll have movements for um, institutional investors to divest from gold in the same way that there's currently a fossil fuel divestment movement. Uh, I don't know if that's coming down the line, but it's something that I would be very interested to see. And then finally, uh, I would just use this sort of micro talk to introduce an idea that I call demand skepticism, which is that as we work to decarbonize the global economy, I think it's important that we introduce a certain raised eyebrow when we're thinking about things because we are working from a limited resource base and we have limited means to go around. Uh, I'm not personally in the mood to decarbonize private air travel. I would much rather decarbonize power generation. And I think we end up looking at the whole wide range of systems and economies and industries and uh, it raises some interesting questions for us from a first principles perspective. You've got one minute left, Stephen. Great. This is me wrapping up. Um, I just encourage us all when we're talking about uh, net zero and climate politics to make sure that we're making room for our own critique. Uh, that was what got us away from the clean coal pitch in the United States. Um, and I think it's what we'll need to be able to continue to move forward. Thank you all. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was really illuminating. Coming as an Indian person, I have a bank vault full of gold, which I don't even want. So, <laughs> yeah. What, what fraction, this is a question from Simona in, in the chat. What fraction of overall mining in volume and impact does gold represent in comparison to um, other metal mining? That includes social and environmental costs. Um, oh. Well, quantifying social and environmental costs is very difficult. I'll say this, the gold mining industry is much smaller than, um, than the iron and steel industry. Smaller, I believe, than the aluminum industry, and I believe a little smaller than copper. But, you know, it's up there, sort of top five. Um, the environmental cost of gold in many ways are are extremely steep because you have a lot of artisanal and small scale miners. So it's not an industrialized sector in the way that the steel sector is. So you have a lot of people literally doing mercury amalgamation by hand um, all over the world. And it's, it's very difficult, awful, and um, yeah, tough labor. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much again, Stephen, for a fantastic talk. And our next speaker is Sonia Gupta. Uh, Sonia is from the Judge Business School and her talk is entitled The Future is Remote, Social Impact of Telemedicine Business in Emerging Markets. So Sonia, you're welcome to share your slides. Thank you. 
Let me stop. So I'm speaking about how the future is remote and how telemedicine business and emerging markets, specifically technologies, India comes up. So to give a background context, uh, I'm just going to under, help you go through all of them very quickly. So telemedicine as a concept has been coming up in 2020. So the, the understanding of this entire concept is around delivery of the healthcare services remotely from a distance, which is very critical factor. It can be including the diagnosis or the treatment, prevention of the disease, or the research and evaluation in the continuing education of health. So basically, it's somewhere at healing at a distance where you can work on the prognosis or the treatment. It has a very sustainable impact in the way of energy efficiency, time and skills. And uh, finance is a different part altogether. So the four things that need to be there to have an element of telemedicine is the purpose of having clinical support, having an overcoming uh, geographical barrier while the person can connect, the doctor or the clinician can connect through the physical distance, and then having some ICT information uh, technologies which play a role for the telemedicine part, and then improving health outcomes as a goal. Overall, the impact, entire impact needs to be studied in a very remote way. I'm coming from India and considering the case of telemedicine in India and how the role has been played out to have a very sustainable impact, specifically as the pandemic uh, has passed across. So the motivating factors for me to study this was specifically how uh, there's a lack of access to healthcare and it has led to a lot of um, expense on the energy, on the environmental, on the human and the financial side of the uh, healthcare industry. And then how there is an abject uh, neglect towards the healthcare uh, in India, especially in the expenditure by the GDP of uh, government. And also the previous studies have always focused on telemedicine as a very uh, complementary services point of view, but not in the form of business point of view or how it can be leading to a very sustainable impact to the work they do and how can the business be sustainable in its concept. So this is a matrix that I tried to combine. This is coming from reports of regulatory approach by GMC UK and telehealth around the world, a global guide, where we can understand how different countries are lying across uh, when if we are comparing to India. So some countries, as you can see in Greens, they are having the laws to uh, guide the right kind of telemedicine firms on how to approach, whereas the purple shows that they are still trying to frame it through the COVID-19 pandemic. India is one of those countries. Uh, they came up with the guidelines for te uh, telemedicine services and businesses in June uh, of 2020. So that's one of the alarming things considering it's such a huge emerging market. And then there are some countries which are still in reds which are not having any guidelines or telemedicine practices, and some are still trying to figure it out in the oranges. So I try to understand the entire study through the literature I review and the marketplace evidence across and try a comparative analysis or case studies that I came across that found innovative ways to proceed with that. And then the interviews and surveys were conducted accordingly. So the literature review is just an aspect. I, I have taken only specific studies which have highlighted the challenges and the benefits that come up in the resistance of the technology and how it's really creating an impact on the nature of the studies. The few studies that focused on was the cost or the financial constraint or geographical locations that was as a challenge. Uh, whereas the benefits that were taken as telemedicine, it focused on the time saving and energy saving and efficiency of how it impacts the geographical range. But the marketplace evidence that I tried to conduct was mainly lying in on the enterprises in India in the past 20 years, which has served the telemedicine industry and trying to understand the factors and forces that drive the business. So we try to focus on commercial enterprises that are established for a fee and not giving free services. So we've not included the government services for telemedicine, which are providing them for free. And also they have some virtual consultation services, which can be downloaded from the app store or the healthcare practitioners. So this is what we could come across. These are the companies that we studied. These seven companies are the top seven com companies which are working in uh, telemedicine in India. And we could figure out how they are actually available on different platforms, deriving the accessibility 
which is so important to drive the sustainable uh, uh, healthcare and uh, to engage the audience in the right way. And then the suitability of it to a particular kind of firm, how important it is. Some firms are still on the lower side of their suitability and appropriateness. And then what are the modes of telemedicine? Are they providing it by call or is it by chat, video, or is it by some sort of messages that they're trying to do? Then we compared them on different angles where we focus on the incorporation. When was the company incorporated and what were the focus areas? So most of the focus areas were clinic management or remote consulting, but some also provided medicine delivery and healthcare management and lab testing facilities. So that is the kind of area that they're trying to focus in tier two and tier three cities of India specifically. And the business model de depends it's either B2B or B2C. And they're using mostly cloud and SaaS and AI, although it's a very early stage in telemedicine. And many companies specifically Pacto and Lightbridge have been able to earn a decent amount of rent in the initial years of their incorporation and expand their outreach. But the uh, uh, fundings are still suffering and that's something that needs to be worked on. So the innovative case studies that we could come across were these three interesting studies where we got to know that Docs app was trying to reach out to the remote people in specific way where one customer really suggested the company if they could recharge their mobile phone instead of having any online payment mechanism. So considering India has a lot of technological problems and uh, challenges with internet facilities, this was one of the things that was suggested by a customer and talks app adopted it where they could easily uh, enable the patient to recharge their phone, get an OTP to get the funding in the debit, and they could operate the business easily in rural areas. Also, they were come up with the patient medic mechanism for a back-end program. Same with Karma Healthcare. It tried to set up e-clinics in rural areas and setups for mobile internet and wireless connectivity to connect with the prescriptions of the doctors as well as patients. Whereas MFine tries to incorporate IoT and new technology like AI to improve the kind of intelligence facilities that they come and also analyze symptoms because one of the problems with telemedicine is to analyze the symptoms correctly. A few interviews were taken uh, among the survey, uh, the, the people who were surveyed in India. It included doctors who use telemedicine, customers who use telemedicine, and then healthcare tele technology companies which are into telemedicine firms or they are enabling some telemedicine firms. Some policymakers and government officials who are related to the telemedicine guidelines and rules and policies and the customers and doctors who are not using telemedicine. So we came across really interesting insights and here are the verbatims that we could come across where some of the people say that secure payment is very important whereas some people say the trust and user friendliness is one of the important things for adoption of a sustainable uh, healthcare environment where they could provide a telemedicine service. The survey really focused on the current status of the telemedicine program, and we had many telemedicine companies which were in the growth and expansion phase. So we had 41 companies which we connected with and interviewed, and many of them are using SaaS cloud or IoT as a way of reaching out to their telemedicine partners and services. The main challenges and factors that came across the study analysis was actually how that customer challenges were one of the biggest problems in helping adopt telemedicine as a very sustainable uh, in healthcare practice, uh, especially in the remote uh, consultation, and how easy and ac access to services is one of the key favorable factors for adoption. And the one thing that really impacts customers as well as doctors in the adoption of telemedicine is the qualification that doctors have as well as the quality of consultation service that is provided on telemedicine portals. So most of the reasons that were given by customers uh, for not using telemedicine was mostly unawareness about the telemedicine services, the lack of trust in virtual uh, healing, and the consultation that of doctors that they could have from their own known doctors or family doctors, which is a very big phenomenon in India. Uh, 
in contrast to what telemedicine firms understand as a reason for not having telemedicine services is the resistance to technology that the customers might have and the lack of trust in virtual telehealth mechanism and the lack of personal interaction. So as we can see, there's a difference between the demand uh, side of understanding of what telemedicine would work as a sustainable way and what the supply side would work in a sustainable way. And when we come across the factors which would affect telemedicine choices. So this is how the first row shows how the doctors understand that telemedicine services really impact. And the second shows how telemedicine firms understand uh, the firm's adoption, whereas the patients who share their understanding of how it should be work. As you can see, there's a similarity in what all of, of these stakeholders understood as quality of consultation service has to be the best and most important factor that comes across for adoption of a sustainable service. Whereas it comes to the communication channel through video, text or call, which is the second most important that has been agreed mutually by all these stakeholders individually. When we come across the policymakers and government officials, they were able to say that the guidelines that have been framed right now, they are trying to make the telemedicine service as a practice which is focusing on low energy consumption, low uh, uh, efficient, uh, high efficiency, and as well as a low cost of uh, funding the healthcare through reliability, accessibility, flexibility, and increasing more literacy around the telemedicine run. Across this, I was able to come up with a, a basic framework that helps us to understand what are the strategies that can be adopted for a business firm which is into telemedicine, because there has been no guidebook for telemedicine firms to follow on how to really incorporate uh, the sustainable way of telemedicine business practice. So we come up with the supply chain, which really involves the technological firms, the payment channels, and the software and hardware uh, channels. And then the demand side comes with the patients and the customers and the doctors, which provide the demand for perspective. So I'm able to come up with the six A's of adoption that really is important for the uh, sustenance and sustainability of the telemedicine firm. First is the applicability that how scope is there? Is it in scope of non-complicated consultations or the refill cases or follow-up cases where it doesn't really require face-to-face -face diagnosis? Next comes appropriateness of what kind of target audience is there. Is the segment really appropriate? Is it suitable or is it non-optimal? And the resources are not really properly allocated. Accessibility talks about how the technologies have to be supportive and infrastructure has to be supported before telemedicine firms come to a host country. Whereas the lack of digital access creates a big problem. The awareness talks about what patient literacy is going to be there in the particular field. Because as you understand, if a country is established with telemedicine firms, but the patients are themselves not knowing enough about the access to the connectivity or they are having challenges with the, the trouble, then it can be a problem. The other part is acceptability. Even if the people know that the literacy or the awareness is there, they might not be able to accept it because of the readiness or challenges, barriers to the technology and the social habits that people have specifically in emerging markets like India. And last is the attractiveness. Once even they accept it, is it the favorite mode of adoption of how they come up to telemedicine and they perceive the benefits of the convenience and customers? This can lead to the future of emerging market strategy, but the directions are focusing on growth and sustainability, on how to really sustain the impact that these are creating, especially in these times. So we are focusing on three aspects, like financial soundness, value proposition, and disruptive innovation. So the financial soundness focuses on what are the revenue costs, because the grant and funding really plays a big role in telemedicine firms, whereas the income from their services, like lab testing or consultation, is equally as important to manage their revenue. When we talk about value proposition, the USP is very important, as we talked about in the case studies. The interesting way of getting unconventional sources, it is very important. And when we come to disruptive innovation, it is important for the telemedicine firms to have a sustainable outlook towards all the stakeholders that really are impacted in the healthcare industry. They have to expand their market to rural and semi-urban markets, whereas they can also expand the technology and use new technologies like AI and cloud and science. The boundary conditions that are able to impact 
these all areas of sustainability which really impact the understanding of how it can be driven are really focusing on the sustainability aspect to impact it and it can be done through regulatory mechanisms because that is one of the areas that really finds the legalities of the businesses whereas the government support really impacts on how it is going to get the fundings or the right to enter a particular market the partnerships and collaborations are equally important to understand how it really works according to the business of sharing and connection the implication that we have of these uh these kind of studies is mostly towards telemedicine firms and policy makers as well as society so the growth and sustainability of new channels is very important for the telemedicine firms as mentioned there has been no guideline or guidebook uh for telemedicine firms in emerging markets where there is still lack of infrastructure or the right kind of customers to establish their network whereas in policy makers they need right kind of guidance set to the documents and the future research needs to focus on the measures that can be worked on to measure all these items and preferences for the perception that emerging market customers have for a sustainable of the telemedicine business whereas society needs to work on the quality of life and the perception that people have towards this shifting change in these times thank you so much thank you very much sonia that was really great um we have one question in the chat uh, just arrived from eric uh, does the emerging telemedicine industry also present an opportunity to help reduce carbon emissions from the healthcare sector yes there there are studies which focus on how we can actually uh, work towards the uh, reducing of carbon emissions as uh, the focus is more on the way that we are not really in in involving the travel costs and we are actually reducing on the costs of equipments that are maybe not required especially for the non interactive kind of studies so that kind of focus can really help these industries and also it focuses on a lot of ways that how these kind of investigations in the healthcare can be remotely done so these have very large impact on the uh, on the, the carbon emissions that we have and also i believe that it is more also about the shifting of the expands that we have on the funding for the healthcare okay thank you um i have a quick question um i was wondering okay. if uh, um do uh, do you think that if if there was a government backed or government subsidized um uh telemedicine healthcare provider that that would be considered to be sort of more uh, favorable to, uh, not yeah perhaps in the uk it may be but in india do you think that that would make a difference so in india it, it, it has been already established uh, in a way that uh, for past 3 4 years there has been a government affiliated uh, telemedicine organization that has been started by the government uh, that's called e sanjeevni and i have been in touch with one of the founding members who's been working there and uh, i got in interesting insights while interviewing him to understand how it really works and in india if there's something for free people sometimes get very suspicious about it that's a cultural norm and if they are supposed to be charged on some aspects then they feel that yes they're paying for a very genuine kind of service so that's a very cultural aspect that needs to be taken care of okay that's really fascinating i wouldn't expect that in yeah. the uk where we have a lot of trust in our government uh, funded medicine but Yeah, yeah very interesting that's where emerging markets shift that's how the cultural norms of customers in emerging markets just shift okay brilliant if there are no more questions then i would like to thank thanks on you again and thank all of our speakers for this really brilliant session today um just a reminder that um we have a cambridge zero research symposium on working globally which is on the 1st of december now this is at a different time from the usual timetable so it will be at 10 o'clock and it's co-hosted with the cambridge global challenges sri the international center for climate change and development and the least developed countries universities consortium on climate change so that promises to be just a really brilliant discussion on how climate change can how it affects the global south so i think it'd be you know uh, really um, insightful for us okay fantastic thank you very much again to the speakers thank you to the audience for his excellent questions and thank you to eric for organizing a really a really great symposium today <laughs> okay bye bye everybody thank you